Hello everyone, uh, we are now live. Uh, we have today with us uh, an eminent uh, SF scholar, uh, as well as a professor of Texas University, uh, Professor Shuparno Banerjee with us. Uh, recently, he wrote a seminal book on Indian science fiction, Indian science fiction pattern, history and uh, hybridity. And uh, we have already reviewed that book uh, on Kalpobisho website. And today with us, uh, also Shumit Bordhan is here. Shumit Bordhan is uh, one of the most prominent SF writer in Bengal uh, right now. And he has uh, multiple, uh, he has written multiple SF uh, novels. And he has recently, uh, he has also written the first Bengali steampunk SF novel. That's a new thing in Bengal for us. And uh, we also have uh, Shondipan and uh, um, Deep Ghosh. We have, uh, we are the uh, team called Pobisho. And uh, we are actually uh, organizing this uh, session uh, with the help of uh, everyone in Kalp Pobisho. And this is the first session uh, I must uh, uh, just add that this is a, uh, th we are planning to uh, start a series of SF uh, discussion and this is the first one uh, in that series. So uh, I will just uh, ask uh, Mr. Shumit Bardun to uh, start the discussion. Okay, uh, thank you Deep, Deep Ghosh and uh, Sandeepan Ganguly and, and the best of the team from Kalpa Biswa uh, for uh, the first organizing seminar. But uh, more than that, uh, for giving me the opportunity to take a, a look at Professor Banerjee's book. And uh, what, uh, what I mentioned in my uh, reviews, uh, the English review which came out in Skorola as, as well as the Bengali review, I think uh, uh, as compared to other reviews of science fiction and Indian science fiction, this is probably a seminal work because what Professor Banerjee has done very successfully is to lay a framework uh, around which probably around future further studies and analysis and detailed research can be made. His, uh, his, his analysis is very subjective. Now we may or may not agree with a few points here and there, but what we cannot disagree is that he has given a solid structure, a foundation on which we can build uh, in future. Now, uh, what I'll do is I, I presume that many of you who are attending this show seminar may not have had a look at the book or, or the uh, or the, or the review. So what I will do is I will just uh, run through a brief uh, slide presentation to give you a background of the book and how Professor Banerjee has handled uh, the, the, the review of uh, Indian science fiction. And so that when I ask him those, uh, my questions, it will probably give you some context. Otherwise, if I jump into the questions straight away, uh, you there may be a sort of disconnect. So Deep, can I have a screen sharing option if it's possible? Yeah, sure. Uh, just give me a second. Mm. I think I already have it. Uh, 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 I I think uh, you have to start it. Then uh, uh, maybe I will uh, yeah, just yeah. forward it. Yeah. The screen sharing option should be at the bottom. Yes. Yeah. Um, so let me yes. go at the top. I'm sorry, I think I should have probably organized this right at the beginning, but since it's not there. So let me go to the first tab and. Um, um so I hope you're able to see my screen. Deep. Is it visible? Yes. Yeah, it's visible. Okay. Uh, uh, so once more, welcome to those of you who have uh, probably joined a bit late. And uh, uh, as I said earlier, before I put my questions to Professor Banerjee, here is a quick look at uh, his uh, book and what he has covered there uh, to give some context so that when we uh, ask him a few questions, there is no sense of disconnect. Of course, this is just about 10 slides and, you know, I cannot do justice to this uh, very detailed uh, work that of literature that is created. But I hope that will give you some broad uh, idea about uh, 
the things that has been covered in the book so that we can take our questions from there. Uh, now, the first uh, 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 challenge of, you know, that Professor Banerjee has addressed is of uh, setting up a boundary because whenever you are, you know, uh, doing some research, uh, there has to be a, a boundary within which that research has to be conducted. Otherwise, it sort of blossoms into a very multifaceted work with uh, not uh, too detailed uh, conclusion. So there are three questions I think he had to answer uh, before even he went into a detailed study of Indian science fiction. The first of is uh, what is science fiction? And then when we say Indian science fiction, what is Indian in that Indian science fiction? Because uh, uh, the word Indian uh, can have multiple contexts. Uh, contexts. It could mean an Indian diaspora living abroad. It could mean uh, uh, a boundary or territory which uh, existed before independence. And then the third is uh, the concern and question of languages because whenever you are talking about Indian science fiction, uh, there is a multiplicity of languages which are available and which have to be sort of uh, examined in detail. Now, that, <clears throat> so let us look at these things and how Professor Banerjee has uh, addressed each one of these uh, in his book before he has gone into the main topic of uh, analyzing Indian science fiction. Uh, the first question is what is science fiction? Now we know it is a very controversial topic. If you go to Wikipedia, there are about 40, 45 uh, odd definitions and a lot of them are in conflict with uh, each other. Uh, now when, so, so before even starting his work uh, in the book, Professor Banerjee had to lay down a definition of what is science fiction. Now here is a challenge. The challenge is if you make the definition very strict, it penalizes creativity. You know, if if you can make a very strict template, and and you know, if I say this as an extra, that we have sometimes seen this while writing ourselves and approaching people, have they have a very strict or structured mindset about what should be science fiction, and that sort of you know sort of curtails the creativity or expansion of the world building as a as an author. On the other hand, if you make it very nebulous or ambiguous or amorphous, then it to analyze it critically becomes very difficult. So if there is a lot of tension, a, a challenge between these two, there's a, uh, these are two ends. If you, if I may have a dialectic and Professor Banerjee had to balance these two concerns, uh, something to something which is not too strict uh, so that it narrows down the focus of his work and not too amorphous, ambiguous so that, you know, it, it, it escapes analysis. Now, to, uh, to start off with, he, he has chosen uh, mainly uh, Darko Sovin's definition of science fiction. And uh, I will, in the next slide, I will just explain what is Darko Sovin's definition. Now, Darko Sovin's definition by itself is not complete, and there are shortcomings. And uh, Professor Banerjee has, uh, you know, taken uh, inputs from Atterby, Reed, and Meeble uh, to counterbalance those shortcomings and then make it much little more uh, complete. But nonetheless, you know, this work uh, stands on Darko Sovin's definition of uh, what is science fiction. So let us first take a look at that definition. Uh, now, Darko Sovin calls science fiction as a literary device. And uh, unlike other literary device, this uh, literary uh, genre makes use of the dissonance between two things, between the reader's cognition and his estrangement. And, and I will probably take up uh, uh, Dr. Banerjee to give us a little more details on these two terms. And it takes the tension between these two, these two ends, these two poles of the reader's cognition and the reader's estrangement, which is current reality, and to create a new world, which uh, Suvin calls novum, which uh, is highly different an universe in the story from the reality that the author or the reader is residing in. Uh, if, if it's just not um, uh, come out a little more complicated, uh, let me repeat that. So you you in this device we take the tension between the cognition or the what the reader understands of, of the current reality and and his estrangement to this reality. And it, in the story, it creates a new world 
and this world is radically different uh, from what reality the author or the reader is currently deciding. Um, now, having understood, having you know, sort of concluded what is science fiction. Now, what is the boundary of Indian science fiction? Because again, here a boundary of framework is very necessary. Otherwise, we 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 probably will end up into going into multiple directions. So, what Professor Banerjee has done is, so he has uh, contained his work uh, within a few uh, uh, what we call filters. The so first is he has uh, taken works from pre-independence uh, British dominion on what was part of the Indian subcontinent under the British, the current Republic of India. He has taken work, uh, literary work created by the global Indian diaspora. However, he has excluded uh, uh, works uh, created by the diaspora of uh, areas which are now part of either Bangladesh or Pakistan. So then, therefore, we have two things now. Uh, we have looked at what is science fiction and I mean, in the context of this book, what we call Indian science fiction. And the third thing is a concern of languages. Now, the problem again, as I said in the beginning, is that if one is looking at Indian science fiction, one has to go through the vernacular literature to understand and read and analyze the science fiction written on those languages. But the first problem is, of course, it's it's almost difficult. It's very difficult, if not impossible. Uh, to uh, have that level of multilinguality given the number of languages we have in India. And it is also compounded in the fact that, uh, you know, most of this work has not been translated, neither in local vernaculars, neither in English. So Professor Banerjee has primarily based his studies on Bengali, Hindi, English and Marathi work. And he has taken additional inputs wherever they are available in English translation from Assamese, Tamil, Telugu and Kannada. Now, of course, you know, this means that there is some amount of uh, work which has been left out probably, which we'll see further uh, research in by other researchers. So these are three things that uh, were used to first create a framework. A, what is science fiction? B, what is Indian science fiction? And what are the languages we are looking at when you are considering Indian science fiction? Now, having set that framework, uh, uh, Professor Banerjee looks at two broad uh, aspects of uh, Indian science fiction. The first is, is history and its evolution. And the second uh, are the narrative elements which form a part of the science fiction literature in, in Indian languages as well as English uh, work created by Indians. <laughs> Let us take the first one, the history of and the evolution of Indian uh, science fiction. Now, Professor Banerjee looks at and has divided uh, this uh, history into four distinct periods, 1835 to 1905, 1905 to 1947, 1947 to 1995, and then 1995 to 2019, which is close to the date of the writing of this book. Now, how are these uh, periods divided and what, uh, uh, what defines them? Let us take a look. Now, the first period is uh, the period of uh, between 1835 to 1905. Um, uh, these, uh, this period is marked by a couple of very important uh, uh, literature. Uh, for the first one was uh, written in English by Casey Dutt, uh, a journal of 48 hours of the year 1945. Uh, and uh, he was written written writing it well before time so for 1945 was still a future uh, to him and then one very important uh, 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 work written in bengali which is sometimes considered if if not the first very close to the first uh, jagadish chandra bose's nirudesha kahin or story of her disappearance written in 1896 this was also the period when we saw the first hindi science section pandit ambika that versus ashya britan coming now, the science fiction uh, written in this period is a direct outcome of the British education system. So whatever was imbibed as part of the colonial education system found a reflection in the work created in this era. The second, uh, the second era is from the period 1905 uh, to 1947. Uh, here also we see very two, two similar works, uh, the feminine utopia 
written by Begum Rokaya in English, Sultana's Dream. And in Hindi, we have uh, uh, Rahul Sanskrita and uh, Hindi work of a social utopia, Vaisvi Sadi. This was a period uh, which saw science fiction sort of consolidating as a genre, uh, more works coming out, uh, works coming out in other languages. And as a sort of, uh, in, a, in a spirit of adventure, we, we the themes are mostly techno-scientific. We saw gadgets, scientists, lost worlds, fantastic adventures. Uh, these were the kind of stories or work created on this period. The third period, uh, the third period was from 1947 to 1945, uh, which uh, all, more, a lot of us consider the golden age. Uh, because there are a huge rise in number of science fiction stories. Uh, this was mostly fueled by the magazine culture, uh, which uh, which was prevalent in those days. Um, the uh, SF narrative also became very much more flexible because, because rather than uh, only investing or uh, or depending on English education systems, we saw the use of uh, indigenous epistemology, indigenous storytelling. In this period, we saw uh, one important milestone, uh, the, the first Indian dedicated science fiction magazine ever, Ashtor Jobai Adres Bardhan, which was uh, established in 1963. Uh, in this period also, Marathi science fiction became uh, very strong by with, and with, through the hands of letters like Bal Fontaine and the famous scientist J.B. Narlikar. Uh, and uh, J.B. Narlikar, uh, since he was astrophysicist, he wrote a story on black hole called Krishna Bibar, which came out in 1974. That last uh, period from 1995 to the modern times has seen a well, uh, rise in English language. As if a lot of Indians, indigenous Indian as well as Indian diaspora have been choosing English as their storytelling medium. And one of the famous works in this period, which uh, won the Arthur C. Clarke, Award in 1995 was Amita Ghosh's The Calcutta Chromosome. And then you have a number of uh, works coming out in this period. I've just mentioned a few. It's not possible to cover all of them. Uh, La Last Jet Engine Laugh uh, by Ruchi Joshi, Vandana Singh's Delhi 2004, Rimi Chatterjee's Signal Red. A lot number of uh, women authors also you know, rose to prominence, has, has risen to prominence during this period. We have also seen uh, the rise of webzines as compared to uh, printed magazines, uh, Kalpa Viswa from Calcutta and Mithila Review from uh, Delhi. So this gives us the history of uh, the evolution of Indian science fiction as covered in the book. Uh, now let us, took that, let us take a look at the narrative elements which Professor Banerjee covers. Now there are four elements that we need to take note of from this book. One is the epistemology or the system of knowledge the time in which the story is set, the space in which the story is enacted, and the non-human characters which form part of the story. Uh, the first one is very important and uh, I think uh, it's close to my heart because this is something which is very uh, fundamental to the world building. This uh, is, a, as Professor Banerjee points out, this is a competitive space. And there are three distinct systems of knowledge which are uh, competing against each other to form the basis of the story. Or, or the first is Western techno science, which uh, the second, the Indian traditional philosophical system, and the regional subaltern systems of knowledge. Now, if I may put aside, if you if you have read Professor, uh, sorry, if you have read Amitabha Ghosh's Calcutta Chromosomes, you will probably know that uh, the story is based on. You know some indigenous knowledge, subaltern knowledge, which uh, uh, helped uh, cure malaria. Um, so, so uh, the Western techno science also has been a part of uh, Indian association from the time it has uh, made a step uh, into a country. Uh, sorry, into the literary scene, and then the new addition is uh, the Indian traditionals and philosophical systems, which we are seeing a lot, some authors apply. The, the next narrative element is the time. This is a time period in which the story is being enacted. So either this can be either the past or the future. Now, when uh, 
an author is imagining the past, an Indian author is imagining the past, it can be either imagined as a golden era, it, it is sometimes imagined as a resistance to colonial uh, forces, it is also sometimes uh, imagined as a challenge to tradition, tradition and uh, 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 upbringing of modernity. Uh, the story can also take place in the future where it uh, uh, deals with the hopes and fears of the characters, uh, their aspiration on, on uh, recognition, the hopes and fears, you know, this you talk about, the stories talk about uh, the, asp the aspirations of uh, a generation with which, which, which is looking for recognition ge ge uh, geographically, politically, uh, economically, as well as there are fears of many inequalities which still persist in society. Uh, the story can deal with either of these, either one or more of these uh, subject areas. The third thing is the space in which the story occurs. Um, now, the, in the in Indian science fiction has very strong utopian and dystopian elements in which uh, a new India is reimagined re where uh, there are oppressive forces which are fueling conflict or even uh, Foreign forces are coming and creating problems. Then um, there you have got stories in like Suvaj Javadekar's uh, journey into darkness, written in Marathi, Sumniti Nam Joshi's Mothers of Mayadeep, which deal with this utopian and dystopian elements. However, one thing that we rarely observe in Indian uh, science fiction as per this book is that we do not see efforts at colonialism or expansions, uh, an expansionist universe. Because probably as Indians, you have been subject to such expansionist forces and con colonial forces. The fourth element is the non-human characters which we find in these books. And this can be things like clones, cybers, artificial intelligences, mutants, alien creatures. Now what Professor Banerjee points out that these non-human elements are projections. And these projections are uh, form a sort of basis are formed on the basis of many societal alienations. And it can be the alienation of a you know a citizen from the state, or a alienation of an immigrant which has moved on to nuclear culture, or it can allude to even foreign invaders. Um, um, and the last example would be Sami Ahmed Khan's aliens in Delhi, which uh, the aliens invading India. So there are many books in this category, and and we have. Uh, Mentioned, I have just mentioned a few Chintamani Deshmukhs, Devamsi Jiva Marile in Marathi, then Sami Amir Khan's Aliens in Delhi, Vandana Singh's of Love and Other Monsters, Samit Basu's Turbulence. I um, mean, the list is pretty large, which goes to show the maturity of Indian science fiction in the current. Uh, so, broadly, that covers uh, uh, the space uh, of uh, in, in which this book operates, uh, the, the elements it covers. Uh, I think we can uh, now go back uh, to the interview and then probably I can start uh, asking a few questions uh, to Professor Banerjee uh, on these uh, areas. So, Dev, shall I start off? Am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank sure. you, Shumit uh, Bhattu. Uh, thank you for your... Uh, very erudite uh, presentation and now I think everyone has a nice grasp of at least what is this book is about. So now I think uh, please uh, you can sir, go ahead and uh, start the uh, discussion. Uh, Professor Banerjee, I think you need to unmute yourself. I think you are muted. Okay. Uh, I'm ready. Good. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, the, my first question to you is uh, that what prompted you to Take up the writing of this book. It's a very complicated and a difficult subject. So, what was your uh, trigger that got you to this book? Sure. Uh, first, I would like to take the opportunity to thank Kalpo Bisho, uh, Deep Kosh, on Deepan Ganguly, and the whole team for um, asking me to join you in this very interesting discussion. Um, and I've been following Kalpo Bisho since its inception. So. Um, it's an honor and also to talk to Shumit Bordhan, one of the most important contemporary authors of our time. Okay, so now I'll go to the uh, question. So uh, 
I have been reading, I think like all of us here, <laughs> were participating in science fiction since childhood. And I've been very, very interested in the genre. And it's it, I've been fortunate to take it as a profession of teaching it and studying it. So that's, that's what I do. Um, I teach in the English department at Texas State University and uh, I teach among many things science fiction, which also includes Indian science fiction. So it is an area of interest for me. It has been one uh, forever. My um, PhD dissertation was on Indian English science fiction and not only Indian English science fiction, but um, depiction of India in science fiction, primarily Indian science fiction and depiction of India in science fiction by Western authors. So this has been brewing. This project has been brewing for, for a long time, at least for the last 15 years or so, um, as a serious thing. Um, but when I, after finishing my PhD, I was thinking about the genre of science fiction um, in general, as it has been happening in India. Um, one thing I noticed was there are very few discussions, I shouldn't say there are no discussions, but there are very few available discussion in the international context about um, the science fiction that are re being written in Indian languages. There, there were few, and while, while I was doing my PhD, I obviously was trying to find sources. So I found sources um, mostly about the things that were written in English. It's like Padmanabhan's works, um, Amitabh Koshe's work, and so on and so forth. And again, just keep in mind, I'm just mentioning a few. There are others. Obviously, as Shumit Babu said earlier, it's not possible to name everything. But um, there have been, as we all know, in discussion of these topics in regional languages. Um, Siddhartha Ghosh has done that. Robin Ball has done that earlier uh, in Hindi, um, I think. Arvin Misra is already watching this. He has done some critical work. Uh, Sriya Narahari has done work on Indian science fiction in other languages. Um, and the problem that I saw was that there's not a whole lot of systematic discussion about it in other languages. Recent years, I would say, last 10 years, there has been a lot coming out. Um, Bodhisattva Chattopadha, I think, is uh, associated with him as well. He has done important works. Um, Onnesha Maiti, another scholar I know of, who has done work on Bengali science fiction. So things have been building up for some time. But I felt that uh, it might be helpful to create a framework um, that will allow us to think about Indian science fiction sort of from a national tradition perspective, although that that tradition itself is problematic specifically for India because as Shungo pointed out, there are so many language traditions, so it's never possible to hold it together. But I thought it would be interesting to see how they interact. Are there similar patterns? Are there similar sort of themes? Are there connections across the um, language barriers um, and what they share, how they um, how, and how they differ, and that's that's in a way was the trigger that prompted me to kind of embark on this journey. Um, I had some already uh, some material from my dissertation, but that was primarily focused on English language SF. But as you know, this is not that this. In this one, I've tried covering as many languages as possible. I don't, I know what, only three of them how to read, three of them um, properly. And I tried finding other uh, translations, um, tried reading some text in Assamese with the help of some friends um, who knows the language. And I think, I think I succeeded in reading a couple of short stories, but I fortunately found some translations as well. So I've had help from other people as well. Um, and um, that made the book possible. OK, thank you, uh, uh, Professor Banerjee. Now, my next question to you is um, uh, for the benefit of our viewers and for me also. 
since you have taken up uh, Darko Suvin's uh, uh, definition as a sort of foundation of your book, I have two questions for you. The first is, uh, you know, could you little explain a little more in detail uh, what Suvin means by this dissonance between cognition and uh, estrangement? And the second question, this same context is, what are the shortcomings in um, Suvin's definition of what is science fiction, which you have tried addressing by using definitions from authors like Mayville and others? Okay, yeah. as, as you yourself pointed out, defining any genre is difficult. Um, Sometimes we try to fall back on simple definitions, but genres are not watertight components. They share similarities across the border. So trying to go for simple definitions often end up excluding a whole lot of other works with similarities of um, trends and characteristics. Now, Suvin's definition is possibly the most influential in, uh, in critical circles because he kind of goes for this formalistic rather than trying to point out specific things that we can see rather than what literary, uh, ultimately science fiction is not science, it is literature. It is a cultural product. Um, it is definitely responding to evolving ideas of science and technology, absolutely true. Most of the time, not always, most of the time. But it is ultimately a piece of literature or film that is cultural production. So Suvin, what he tries to do is create that sort of a formalist framework uh, in which, again, it's a complicated discussion, but I'm trying to kind of narrow it down and simplify it for the sake of time. The two keywords, cognition and, and estrangement, uh, he aligns cognition with the idea of science, process of knowing, understanding, categorizing, and not in a science. And as I think as Indian community, we know that knowledge, the idea of knowledge is a little bit vaster, big and is bigger rather than thinking about just science. And his point is exactly that, that usually English language use of science is very much pointed towards technology, like techno science. Um, but science is also knowledge, knowing. So he aligns idea of cognition with something that we know and understand, able to understand. And estrangement is some making something strange, unknown. Okay, something that we don't comprehend. So if you look at most of science fiction, it, there's a desire for going for the unknown. Speculate. We speculate about things we don't know, right? Something new, something that is radically different from our own time, space, so on and so forth. Um, but according to Suvin, that new thing that comes up in science fiction happens because of this constant struggle between the tendencies of knowing and not knowing. So knowing about something not known in a more systematic manner. So one point that he points out, uh, that he makes rather, sorry, um, the estrangement that is something unknown that often happens is not scientific at all, in the sense that there's no science directly involved sometimes that creates this break. But rather, anything that develops from that point onwards is more logical rather than randomly changing things, which he kind of uh, pushes towards the sign, a side of fantasy, which does not follow, necessarily follow a specific rigorous logical pattern. So if you if you think that's what's happening, so sorry, if you see these points, then a large number of science fiction texts kind of falls within this um, within this kind of framework, if you come to think about that. Um, we want to see things, we want to discuss things or paint things that are still not here during our time and place, uh, or rather the author's time and place. That's what he said, not our, not, not the readers, but the author's time and space. But um, we get there with some sort of structure, some sort of um, 
logical method. So that's that's what Suvin was saying. Now the problem that appears, which I was just mentioning before coming to Suvin, is that uh, they're not watertight components. Um, and all these ideas evolve over time. What is scientific, what is not scientific, what is scientific in one community, logical in one community may not be that in another community. Um, so whose science, like China Mevil brings up, whose science are we talking about? That was his point. Um, so like the epistemological uh, chapter, if you be, uh, think about, I pointed out there are multiple ways of knowing that happens in, in Indian culture, which which has a strong base of support. People believe in those things. So are they not methods of knowing? What about them? Again, I'm not endorsing this or that. I'm, what I'm doing here is trying to find out what's happening in the text. So a lot of text um, often takes up knowledge bases, which may not necessarily be the same as techno science or colonial science. And again, uh, you pointed out uh, Amitav Koshia's Calcutta chromosome as an excellent example. There are others. I just mentioned this one because it's probably the most prominent one. So the attempt at definition can be very simplistic if anyone, anyone wants to be, or it can be really complex. Um, it depends on how much or how wide you want to cast the net. If, uh, if you just choose one thing that um, science fiction is a text that talks about science and technology, that can be a definition. We have Big Gun Bhittik Golf, if you remember, or Tales of Science. That is science fiction in a sense. But if you think about Audrey Gordon's writing, a lot of them do not really have any science in them, uh, but has what uh, Carl Friedman, another um, very prominent SF scholar, mentioned cognition effect or something that seems like science. Kolpo began. It's not began, but Kolpo nar began in Bengali, if you think about it. So I kind of tended more towards that because it gives me a wider net, which can include multiple different kinds of work, which has, which shares ideas, shares, themes, uh, which may not necessarily be only scientific, but there are similarities with that and say um, Narlika's writing, which often have very specific scientific thesis at the heart of it. So that's, um, I, does that answer the question? Yes, I, I think it does uh, to a large extent. Of course, we can go on debating on this point till uh, midnight and will not be ended. But since you have got uh, limited time, let me move on. Probably if I may add a point over here is uh, when we we talk about science and not science and stories which uh, do not uh, contain too much of hard science. I think one example I give is H.G. Wells' time machine. Now, if you look at time machine, uh, there's hardly any science. The time machine is, you know, what the Greeks would call a, a deus ex machina. It just serves the purpose of transporting uh, the main protagonist from one place to another and the story then unfolds a time machine beyond that has no no scientific explanation no 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 role to play it just recedes in the background uh, but uh, thank you for your uh, very detailed explanation uh, let me come to the third question to, to you is this periods of uh, time period that you created the four periods in which you have divided was this arbitrary or was have you followed certain logic uh, to divide the evolution of Indian science fiction into these four distinct time uh, periods? That's that's actually a very, uh, very good question. And I I, always, I thought a long time about that. So I'm glad you asked about it. And, and you'll see what I mentioned is loosely conceived period in my book. I said like this, obviously, any time period like the definition cannot be <laughs> hard and fast, right? Because there are periods. So one thing I would point out first, it is a thing or device or a framework that helped organize the discussion. Um, but secondly, it's not completely arbitrary. Um, so if you look at the first period of time, it um, covers a long stretch of time and then it gets progressively shorter. So one, one thing there is that there's not a lot of works. 
coming out in the 19th century. It's just initial period. And between 35 and 1905, I found two convenient points. 35, I consider to be the first futuristic narrative in Koilas Chandra Dutt's text. And 1905, another English language text, Rukeya's, Begum Rukeya's text, um, Sultana Stream, uh, which is another landmark work. So it seems like it would be interesting to see what happened within this period of time. And, and if you look at the works that we have, many of them are first of their kinds in the Indian context. And from 1905 to 1947, again, a very important year. So I thought it would be interesting to see what happened in the beginning of the 20th century by the time we have independence. And there are very, very many interesting things happen. We, we have um, the magazine culture start mostly in the earlier part of 19th century. Many of the languages um, start seeing texts which start exhibiting qualities of science fiction. So if you look at these, they are different from each other. The first period from 35 to 1905 and 1905 and 1947, there are differences in the things that are going on in the context of Indian science fiction, but you can say, why not 1900, why 1905? Why not at the end of the century? Um, we could have done it because 1900, we also had publication of um, Chandra Loki Yatra, another important text there. But I found that to be more similar to the earlier texts that we talked about, like uh, Ascharya Vrittant or uh, Rahoshro in Bangla and so on and so forth. And 1905, and 1924, Rahul Sankritan's utopian narrative, they seem to provide similar sort of frameworks of getting at texts. So you can say a second period was conceived around that, uh, around that sort of issue, but as, if you, as you have read the book or anybody who reads the book will see, I'll also point out rise of magazine cultures, um, works like Shukumar Rai, Hemendra um, Maroy's work. Um, and um, other other um, developments as well. Now, 47, obviously, we all know why 1947, and there are implications of independence, obviously. Um, and many of us agree that that middle part of 20th century is possibly known as the golden age in many languages. So that, again, gives you an... Um, an impetus to club them together as this is the time period when these things are happening. And again, I could have gone on to the 2000 rather than 95, but it seems that Amitav Ghosh's Calcutta chromosome served as a very important catalyst. Again, Amitav Ghosh didn't really write science fiction afterward, but the text itself, at least for me, is a landmark in the sense that it projected Indian as if, um, or rather I should say, it placed Indian as if more strongly in the international context. Is it true that no, it's no longer appreciated in India? Absolutely not. This uh, discussion itself is a proof that it is very important in, in India. And uh, we also have the Indian Association of Science Fiction Studies, Indian uh, Association of Science Fiction Writers established around that period. We had Balfond case, um, anthology, it's very important work coming out around that time. Um, uh, Bigyan Kotha, Hindi science fiction magazine, uh, starts around that time. So there are many things happening in, in various uh, SF communities. Um, and still, it seems something that has not happened before is that Indian SF has been now placed in the world international context. And I start seeing that after 95, uh, we have Manjula Padmanabhan's Harvest, which we winning international awards. And if you look at my chronology, again, it's a very brief chronology. It doesn't have a man, many things in it. Obviously, brief chronologies are for that reason, some things. I kind of projected that as well, that uh, as we have come closer, to clo closer and closer to our own time, since the 1990s mainly, um, it has become, Indian science fiction has become more and more prominent in the international global stage. So that 
that is the reason for cutting it off around that time. And who knows what's to come. So that's the last portion. OK, thank you. Thank you, Professor Banerjee. And uh, we are running out of time. But still, I cannot uh, sort of uh, prevent myself from asking one last question, and after which probably I'll hand over to Deep for questions he wants to ask. And then I think Sandeepan is also waiting to fill the questions that uh, readers must be uh, fielding right now. Uh, now, and this uh, this my question concerns the use of uh, uh, the Indian philosophical epistemology. Now, uh, what I've seen is normally is whenever uh, we talk about application of Indian systems of knowledge or philosophy, there are two tracks. The first one is is simpler, and it is nothing wrong in that. Is that basically a retelling of Indian mythology in, in in a futuristic setup? So you only have, you have stories, and you have very excellently done graphic novels. I think Korava 5000 was one of them. Uh, and uh, stories of Ramana and, and, and Mahabharata sort of extrapolated in the, in the future space. It's, I think. Now that's, that's a, it, it's a very simple thing. It's, uh, and there's not too much of new storytelling in that, apart from that, uh, that the background or the world building is changed. Now, when it comes to actually applying it to a new story, the, the challenge sometimes is to see that create a balance between application of that story in 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 a context of how you have defined science fiction uh, with respect to uh, uh, suvin that creating uh, you know using the dissonance between uh, the cognition and essence reality that's one way of applying how do we apply indian philosophical thought into that because the danger i see is the moment we talk about application of indian philosophical system the chances are, you know, that the author ends up trying to sort of rewind the clock and paint a golden edge and create a sort of uh, uh, move back into the past uh, kind of approach. So I see this sort of uh, uh, tightrope work. And how do you, my two questions to you, how do you think that can be resolved? Or have you seen any work where this Indian epistemology has been very successfully applied in a souvenir like framework? Uh, first, I would like to uh, say that I have taken Subin's definition, but the rest of the discussion, if you think about, basically displaces the whole idea of that there is a Western science is very that that sort of thing, and that whole chapter about epistemology basically point out that that what is science or knowledge can be conceived in multiple different ways. So um, I do not necessarily see any formalist dissonance if we find and we can take a talk about professor shonku stories because it, it does something similar which is not necessarily science seems like fantasy right? but if you take them as valid methods of knowledge then it functions um, i'm thinking about sharnapurni making of the miracural uh, thing so i think that's an interesting Thing because we all know that uh, Ayurveda works, not always, but it works. It is a method of um, treating um, illness that's that's um, very much applicable. But if you think about that story, so Shonku gets the formula from a sannyasi, right? A shadu, shadu, if I remember correctly, who gave it to him. Um, and then he analyzes it. See that, that there is this tradition of um, aesthetics, dispensing medicinal knowledge coming from the Himalayas, all this classic mythical framework, but it comes to the laboratory. Shonku tries to made it, make it into a tablet for easy consumptions, which is very much similar to Western science. Or I use keep on using Western science. I'm what I'm trying to do that is, which we associate the term. Obviously, there's nothing Western or Eastern. Um, but laboratory science, let's say. Um, but when he tries to make it into large scale production, it doesn't work. When he takes that to England, right? That's where he goes. And they try to analyze it. They could not identify the specific thing. So what I was talking about applying indigenous epistemology in the sense that in that story, it's very clearly uh, Shruttajit Raya has taken up the ideas of Ayurveda as a valid mode of science or knowing or application of knowledge of nature in treating diseases and put it into 
uh, more recognizable mode of science fiction for many people, which is a scientist creating something um, unique, a, a medicine that cures everybody. He takes it to the West, it works, but the West fails to kind of analyze and remake or make it into factory, large, large scale production and so on and so forth. So I think that's a, that I, I would say that's a successful application of Indian epistemology in dealing with um, this sort of ideas. And the other point that I would like to make is I do realize the danger that you're talking about, um, what can happen, but I also find them fascinating the way this can be utilized after we're reading stories. Reading stories can be dangerous. So there is a responsibility thing that you're pointing out. I agree with it. But they also um, create very interesting uh, situations. I would also point out Judge Narlikar's um, or, uh, cosmic explosion in which an ancient sage pointed out um, that there is a supernova somewhere from his observation. And later on, people didn't pay attention, uh, but he was using actual astronomy, Indian astronomy, which was advanced. We all know that. So he, he observed that and predicted things will happen. People didn't really pay attention. And thousands of years later, that thing happened. So that is also an application of ancient Indian science or at least astro astronomical calculation, um, not necessarily walking back in that sense, but what could have happened, what sort of observation that could have been used. I'll stop here because I know we have we have constraints of time. Um, uh, thank you, Professor Banerjee. I think uh, I could still ask you questions, but we have constraints of time. So I would uh, request Deep to ask a few questions, and then from there on, Sandeepan can uh, probably take questions from the viewers because we are very tight down for time. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for your very uh, ex explanatory answers. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Banerjee, and thank you, uh, Shumit Bhadhan, uh, for the wonderful discussion. Uh, I will not take uh, much time because we are in very much time constraint and there is not much time left, and we have to take some question also. So um, after this, all this engaging uh, conversation, I just uh, want to ask a very silly question. Maybe it's a silly question. Uh, I just uh, saw in your book when you made the time uh, graph of uh, our Indian science fiction, you have put Chacha Choudhury in it, and that actually attracted my attention. So, why do you think that Chacha Choudhury is an important part of Indian science fiction? That's I wonder. Even the timeline, right? Yeah. <laughs> there are several reasons. I divide, debate it if I want to put it there or not. Uh, one <laughs> thing is that if you think, uh, remember, Chacha Choudhury's sidekick, Shabu, is a being from Jupiter. Yeah. yeah. So yes. Chacha Choudhury in itself is not necessarily science fiction, but I thought that Chacha Choudhury mm -hmm. is very popular. It has been very popular all yes, over yes, India, yes. if I remember correctly. Even, even I country. also read a lot of Chacha Choudhury in my childhood days. And his brain works faster than computer and those things. Right, faster than computer. In some cases, they have sent Raka, one of their arch rivals, to space uh, as a uh, punishment and so on and so forth. Um, right. And the reason I put Chacha Choudhury there is because it is an iconic comic book. Comic book has taken up science fiction in various uh, at various times, and there are other like Doga, Bhokal, and the Nagaras. There are lots of Hindi comics as well. We also yeah. know that Bantul Degrade sometimes takes up that sort of thing. Robots, Nonte Fonte has been built their robots, <laughs> so there are a whole bunch of those, but. I thought Chacha Choudhury was uh, nationally popular. It's a comic book, and it has this SF component, which is outlying, but it is there. A very important yeah. character is an alien. So yeah. it, I should mention something of that sort there, that it happens. So as you know, it's very yeah. brief timeline. So yeah. there are lots that could have been included. It's not there. And that's what not what the timelines are for, actually. So Chacha Choudhury is a landmark comic book which utilizes science fiction. Um, so that's why it's there. OK, uh, another question. Maybe it has been already discussed. But still, as we are saying about the big gang part that is a philosophical part of India, that, that encapsulates is also 
so uh, we are talking about professor shonko and it's a very very uh, debatable issue still that whether how much science fiction is in professor shonko and how much science fiction is not since we are actually borderlining science fiction and fantasy with this uh, maybe with this uh, broad sense of kalpa vigyan so how we will define professor shonko uh, uh, as a science fiction when professor shonko using a computer to summon a ghost of his ancestor what are we going to say about that or professor shonko is using a uh, spell to conjure up uh, bones and from there uh, there is there is going up a, a live dinosaur or the sort of things that he is using that uh, spell to re he recording it and he is using it try to using it scientifically so the science fiction angle is maybe there but still there are lots of fantastical stuff is happening also and so that's why i cast a wider right. net if you think about that's why i use more of a kalpa uh, kalpa bishu kind of uh, sorry not kalpa kalpa vigyan kind of no rather than vigyan katha kind of net mm -hmm. um, because for me uh, not for me if you think about again that is the reason i spent so much time talking about epistemology for many people yeah. some of those spells are real uh, some of those things are real uh, i don't think anybody has tried conjuring now for dinosaur with a spell yet <laughs> but spells can bring people back to life for a large part life. of indian population yeah. again I, as i was saying i'm not endorsing one type of knowledge over other what i was doing as i found it fascinating that so many kinds of knowledge bases are at competition with each other and vying for okay this is this is a valid way of representing creating a world or building a world as a story um and often we see a interesting interaction between laboratory science techno science with that sort of thing and definitional debates will always be there and i don't think it's go going to go away anytime soon mm -hmm. even if we have books like darko subin's old book 1979 is probably the first one to engage into that in really detailed way and there are others uh, every author has their own definitions um, asimov has a definition some people prefer that uh, clark has his definition um Hugo Gernsback had his definition. Joseph Cam uh, Campbell has a definition. So there, there, there are so many definitions. Ursula Le Guin has her definition. So there are so many ways. In our our Indian context, there are definitions which are stricter sometimes, sometimes looser. So my uh, intention was not to create a strict definition, but rather looking at text which interact. and can be loosely conceived as science fiction for example let me let's move away from epistemology we can just go to uh, ghanada um ghanada stories are tall tales ashare gopo in our bengali if you come think of it sits there tell stories but when we get in there into the stories they are often science fiction or uh, for that matter shukra bhoman uh, jagadananda rai shukra bhoman one of the earliest stuff yes. everything happens within a dream but once we get into the dream it's travel to Ven uh, venice and so on and so forth so hmm. and sometime it was uh, at one point it was those journeys happening in dreams and other stuff and so i rather chose to examine anything that could be uh, associated with this broad idea of science fiction um and there are lots i did not discuss which and as very specific reason is they would probably be read more productively along with mythology or fantasy there's nothing wrong other people may actually try to read it with science fiction i have nothing to say about that i i felt that these have these interaction that i'm talking about more prominently than others yeah uh, as a reader of uh, bengali science fiction or current bengali science fiction what i have uh, seen that lots of uh, bengali science fiction is all uh, produced in uh, juvenile literature actually you have known that uh, various magazines they have uh, they are the source of bengali science fiction for past maybe uh, 20 or 30 years apart from uh, some uh, astrojo fantastic or bishoy so those magazines ju juvenile magazines there uh, what i have seen uh, maybe it's recent trend that 
there are lots of science fiction coming up which are not really science fiction in any way they are not really fantasy or not really science fiction they are kind of a juvenile tale and mixture of science fiction and fantasy and there are lots of robots there are lots of uh, like aliens and those kind of crop throwing around <laughs> everywhere and the whole thing is uh, something neither science fiction nor fantasy or at least what uh, i want to read <laughs> neither of them are those so that's why uh, th this is my uh, uh, as a uh, science fiction reader this is my primary concern that if we can't really define a, uh, what is what can be or what is uh, at least loosely a science fiction story then how we can tell a new writer new author who want to write science fiction how we are going to tell him that this is how you have to write a science fiction uh, that's that's my primary concern actually and i think you are coming from a uh, editorial team's perspective right because you do yes, have yes, practical exactly. concern yeah which i don't have i i read <laughs> what you publish sumit <laughs> <laughs> babu writes you publish i read and then i say okay this is this and that is that <laughs> i think all of us are coming from different perspectives right and, right yes and and obviously they will be very different right hmm. Right. Uh, uh, anyway, another uh, another question is uh, what I have seen that uh, lots of English science fiction are going uh, gaining uh, traction uh, for the past few years. Uh, they are uh, getting uh, nominations from different uh, angles. Uh, different uh, uh, Western nominations are coming up. Hugo and Nebula and everything. But what about the vernacular science fiction? How we can uh, promote vernacular science fiction more? Because I feel that there are lots of hidden gems as there still there, which can compete with all the stories which are uh, written in English and getting Western traction. But uh, those vernacular writers and the vernacular stories they are still uh, unknown to a large portion of our uh, readers. In even in English and in maybe in uh, Western readers, like uh, last uh, in last few years, uh, only one uh, book has been published, uh, South Asian science fiction. There are some some uh, stories which are published, uh, which are translated and published uh, in English uh, in that uh, portion. But still, large amount of vernacular stories are there. I think it's not about only Bengali. It's in even Tamil or Hindi or uh, other uh, language is there but uh, not such uh, translation work is going on so how to tackle this problem what do you think yeah, i think you already answered that there needs to be translation right so yeah but uh, the whole whole uh, community is also fragmented i, I don't think uh, there are much uh, actual effort is coming up to uh, uh, translate uh, the volumes of the work. Uh, I, I know that Dr. Misra is here with us today, and I will also um, request him to uh, take up uh, the, this responsibility and take up some projects to translate uh, uh, and produce some good translation work about uh, other uh, language and vernacular books. Yeah, I have also. Uh, uh, requested uh, i think at one point i had a conversation earlier with a few years ago with dr mishra mm -hmm. and uh, i've also spoke to sri narohari um mm -hmm. i think they are they have been in the in that field for a long long time they can really right. contribute right. Yeah. Uh, tarun sent as you mentioned uh, the south asian mm -hmm. science fiction that was a very i think interesting work uh, because he brought mm -hmm. out uh, south asian could be another framework I had yeah. India as a framework, South Asia could be another framework. And I hear that the next uh, volume of that would probably have more translation. That's what I that's yeah, what he, yeah. yes. uh, told yes. me at some point. OK, uh, since we have very short amount of time, and <laughs> still I got lots of questions. But I will uh, forward this to Shondipan. And Shondipan, please 
be conscious because uh, there are some questions we need to uh, follow up with. Uh, first, uh, am I audible? Hello? Yes. Yes. Yeah. First, I take a few cues from our uh, reader base. Uh, for instance, Orn of Shade has already asked that uh, whether this golden age concept itself is uh, relative uh, the, in the Indian context, whether we can properly I and mean, clearly demark this golden age. What, do you, what is your cue on this particular subject? Uh, yes, I agree. E everything is relative. There's no. Um, no hard and fast boundaries anywhere. I and I think I've tried mentioning that many places in my book that this is this is not a prescriptive thing. This is what I found to be helpful. The the simple reason for me to call that portion middle of the nineteenth twentieth uh, century the golden age in the sense that golden golden age of indigenous science fiction in the sense that there's so many different languages started having science fiction. And it could vary, vary depending on which language you are dealing with. As as Arnold said, he, he's absolutely right. Um, some other language might start having science fiction texts at this moment. Not every language has science fiction traditions, even now. So it, they might want to call 2020 the golden age, start of the golden age for that um, specific language. So it, it is definitely relative. So another question I've got from uh, Rakesh Kumar Dash. Uh, do you find any distinct idea or premise or style or subgenre which is originally Indian science fiction and not borrowed from Western science fiction or Indian mythology? I, I think I can see that question. Let me just quickly read it again. Is there any, any unique element in Indian science fiction which is not borrowed from these occidental you know, elements or Indian mythology? And, and he again uh, uh, continues the lack of expansion colonialism. I, I think that was something that I found interesting in the sense that I did find some some stories in the older Asturja where people go to moon and they encounter some aliens and they fight over them. But in general, I have seen that part that we, if, and if you think again, you, you deal with uh, Bangla science fiction all the time, at least the period I was studying, I did not see too many colonialism, like settler colonies and things like that, a lot going out and colonizing. Um, I did find a couple which have gone th th that talks about intergalactic travel and so on and so forth. But in most of the time, it does not seem that um, the desire of colonialism very strong. So that that could be one, um, and the others. I, I think I mentioned that in the discussion of time, um, a lot of Indian science fiction, specifically in the ver uh, in the indigenous languages, are set in a contemporary time, like present, neither past nor future, but at the present. So things happen in the present. Some sort of specific device shows that this is a parallel time or something changes, but neither projected far into the future nor uh, past. Again, I'll talk about um, a, a lot, lot of those Shunku stories, if we consider them science fiction, happen during his time frame, contemporary time, not in the past nor in the future. And there are other works. I just mentioned Shunku because it's easiest to recognize for many people, perhaps. But many other stories happen uh, in the contemporary time rather than future or past, which I think is quite prominent in Indian science fiction. I, I am not saying that doesn't happen in any other science uh, fiction tradition. And again, I'm not aware of everything. But I've read, if when I read other uh, language traditions, many of those are either taking place in the far future, or alternate universe, that sort of thing. So this might be interesting to think about, that it happens in Indian science fiction often. If I if I, I just a... interrupt, if I just may interrupt over here, sorry, Sandeepan. And the, I mean, that question of setting up colonies and expansion, one probable uh, exception may have been a short story I novel I wrote called Kostu, probably um, two, three years back, which is actually uh, based on settling of colonies but uh, these are people who are fleeing from exploitation from earth and then they set up their uh, own nook to free that operation so sorry mm -hmm. sorry for 
breaking into what I thought I'll just uh, add that to one here. Sorry. Sir, I would please. like to read that very much. Where, where can I find it? Uh, okay, don't read it right now because I'm planning to rewrite it soon. Soon, okay. soon okay. in brackets <laughs> because time is another. And uh, once okay. I do that, I'll surely share a copy. And and obviously they are there. It's not like they're not. Uh, I think Siddhartha Goshe is Mohakash uh, Moni Mukto. It is about yeah. this colony, right? Where yeah, yeah. But that that was a prison colony. Prison colony, yes. But that yeah, is still yeah. a colony. So some some of yes. those are there. It's not like that it's not there, but not a lot of them. That's that's what I mean. There is another another story. Chandel uh, Bukhe One Day. Uh, have you read it by Siddhartha Ghosh? Uh, it was about a one-day match with uh, Dunad 11 versus uh, uh, Arth 11, the one-day match. So uh, at the uh, start beginning, they they will uh, think that uh, from uh, it is from the all the descendant of lunar uh, colonists, but at the end they will understand that all those colonists are dead and they have uh, created some robots to replace them. And those robots are now want to come as mainstream, and they want to uh, like uh, interact with human from Earth. So there was a yeah. colony, but it was replaced by robots. Also, uh, Orvin Mistras, Kumbh uh, uh, ke Mongolvasi, the Mongolvasi comes to Earth to Kumbh Mela. So there is a settlement in Mars. But my point was that uh, that none of these are primarily seeking to go out, explore, and capture that colony, which yeah, we often yeah. see in many other uh, Western SF, like Starship Troopers or Ender's Game, uh, that that sort of series. Their interaction is a little bit different. That was my point. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, just running out of the time, so this is the last question. Yeah. Huh? yeah. So I have a small curiosity of my own that, uh, yeah, we do understand that uh, if I consider the uh, larger framework of science fiction, it certain, uh, sometimes it you know depicts certain dialectics which emerges from the status quo and all. Uh, we have elements in our, you know, the folklores of Bengal, suppose, uh, you know, by compilation by Reverend Lal Bihari Day and then by, um, from the Thakur Marjuli and from those elements. So. If we uh, like sort of deconstruct those elements over there, for instance, say uh, Buddha Butum, which can be you know we can take a parallel of that with you know genetic engineering, okay, with all the sort of this modification. Okay, now can if we take that as having science fiction elements, so whether that predates the demarcation of science fiction. And that was my point that I was saying that I want to consider some because does it make sense or does it contribute anything to read it as science fiction or is it better read alongside of something that is does it does it pretend to be science fiction that's i think one of the things like does the story present itself as science fiction that's that is one idea i also find interesting to think about while again you and deep has different uh prerogatives because you are trying to find stuff that you publish but when i was thinking about uh, I sometimes think: Does the story present itself as a story of science, story like science that can be considered science fiction? Does it pretend, or is it a fairy tale? Does it present itself like a fairy tale? So that sometimes is important for me. And um, if you think about Buddha Bhutum, I, again, that's my perspective. I don't think it pretends to be science fiction. It just happened, no. right? <laughs> These are the things that happen and it can be, there are curses and stories. So I feel they can be read more productively, more uh, interestingly, along with other sort of fairy tales and fantasies or myths, folklore, so on and so forth. Uh, as I said, these are all sometimes related genres. They're not mimetic. They're not real. They don't, are not based on realism. Science fiction is possibly a realistic storytelling pattern within these non mimetic genres more realistic in that sense. So again, I don't necessarily have a specific answer, but uh, um, I, I, I would not necessarily read that sort of fairy tale as science fiction. Okay, uh, I think uh, 
we are running out of time because uh, Professor Banerjee has some other uh, uh, things to do <laughs> today. So we are we'll end this uh, like uh, discussion, this lively discussion right now. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Professor Banerjee. Thank you, uh, Mr. Baldon. Thank you, Shundipon. And thanks for all our viewers, especially uh, we have Dr. Sri Narawari and Dr. Arvind Misra with us. Thanks for your valuable inputs. And maybe I think uh, we are going to continue this uh, lecture sessions and maybe uh, we'll, we'll have Dr. Um, Arvind Misra and Dr. Sri Narawari also with us. Uh, in, in a future session. We'll be very glad to have them with us and see their views. Thank you. Thank you all. And uh, thank you for we'll being present video. and watching us. Uh, thank you, Deep Sandeepan and Professor Banerjee. And then thank you all of you who have been watching this. And I hope uh, we continue these lively sessions with uh, regularly when uh, you know have more speakers and we have more thoughts and all of us get to learn from each other. Thank you and have a good night or uh, in case of Professor Manaji, have a good day. <laughs> we are different time zones. Thank you all, and then please take care. Thank you. Jeff. Thank you. And again, I, I applaud you for uh, taking up this sort of um, initiative, which creates more and more discourses in the field, which I think is necessary. And also, uh, I have read some of the research works that is being conducted uh, regarding. Specifically, um, I think Deep, it was you and someone else who published regarding uh, Jagodananda. Uh, uh, yeah, it's um, uh, right. me and Shantu. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you and Shantu published And that, that sort of uh, research were into the uh, lang local language science fiction mm -hmm. is very, very much necessary. Mm -hmm. Thank you again. Thank, Thank you all. You. Thank you all. Thank you.